Welcome to Calvary. My name's Brad. And I'm Rachel. We're so glad you've joined us today. If it's your first time joining us, please click that welcome tab. Let us know who you are. We have a small gift to send you to say thank you for being with us today. And I want to thank our entire Calvary Church family for your continued generosity. It's because of you that our ministry remains strong. And if you'd like to partner with us, you can donate by following the information at the bottom of the screen. All right, Calvary, let's worship. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you again. We're going to start with some thanks. Here we go. Give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. Give praise to the Lord. Beside Him there's no other. Give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. Give praise to the Lord. Beside Him there's no other. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. Whoa, I will rejoice and be glad in it. He brought me from mourning to dancing, from glory to glory. This is the day the Lord has made. What are we waiting for? Come on and praise the Lord. Hear the word. Lord, there's freedom for the captives, good news to the poor, and beauty for the ashes, so what are we waiting for, what are we waiting for, this is the day and be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. Oh, I will rejoice and be glad in it. He brought me from morning to dancing, from glory to glory. This is the day the Lord has made. So what are we waiting for? Come on and pray. To tell what the Lord has done, I live to sing of my Savior's love. I live because He is risen. Let's sing that again. I live. I live, I live to tell what the Lord has done. I live to sing of my Savior's love. This is the day the Lord has made I will rejoice and be glad in it This is the day the Lord has made Whoa, I will rejoice and be glad in it This is the day the Lord has made And be glad in it. He brought me from morning to dancing, from glory to glory, from morning to dancing, from glory to glory, from morning to dancing, from glory to glory. This is the day the Lord has made. So what are we waiting for? Come on and praise the Lord. What are we waiting for? Come on and praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Yes, God. We thank you, Lord. Father God, 
we want to come into your house today with a sense of purpose. We know that you long to meet with us. And so we come now, Lord, and say to you, we desire to meet with you here today. We desire to set our week aside that is behind us and to not even draw attention to the week ahead of us, Lord, but to solely focus on you. For you are where our help comes from. And so God, we turn our eyes to you. We turn our thoughts to you. We turn our entire focus on you, Lord, and we want to be in your presence and spend time with you. So come be with us now as we sing of your goodness and your faithfulness, Lord. Would you come and, and have an encounter with us here today? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We love you, God. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God.
Spirit. 
change a sky Will you change us, Lord? Come and light the flame within us, God For we need more of you It was not by my own earning To have the helper at my side the gift was fully purchased when the Lamb was crucified. So now freely I can ask Him, for His blood has washed me clean. Let the dove of heaven rest upon the Christ in me. Let the dove of heaven rest upon the Christ in me. Holy Spirit, come and rest upon the Christ in me. Holy Spirit, the truth, the living water. All we need is more of you. We want more of you. Holy Spirit, the heaven. Today as we celebrate communion together, I'm reminded of all that communion represents. Yes, it represents the death of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, but it also represents our participation in Jesus' death and resurrection because communion invites us to participate. It's a reminder that we too must die to ourselves and be raised with Christ. It's a reminder that we are dead to our old sinful past and we are new creations made alive in Christ through his death and resurrection, through the revitalizing power of the Holy Spirit. So today as we remember the words of Jesus when he instituted the Lord's Supper, when we partake of these elements, let's remember that we are new creations because of what Christ has done. In, in the horrific act of hanging on a cross, Jesus bought us back and made us new, and we are to die to ourselves daily and walk in the new life that is promised to us through Jesus with the hope of eternity with him. In the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul records that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's receive together. Let's proclaim together. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your amazing sacrifice that you lived the perfect life that we were supposed to live, and that you willingly went to the cross and died in our place, taking our punishment upon yourself. And through your death and resurrection and the power of the, the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, we are made new. 
we are dead to our old selves and we participate in your mission in this world. Help us to always remember that, that we are new creations. Help us to always walk in the newness of life that you have provided to us. And help us to never, ever forget your amazing sacrifice. We love you so much. In your name, amen. My name is Rachel and I'm a director here at Calvary. On Sunday, May 28th, our annual Calvary Church Vision offering will be taking place. This is a one-time sacrificial gift above and beyond our regular tithes and offerings that will enable us to continue to effectively serve our community and improve our facilities. With the completion of our parking lot project last year, we've already managed to pay for 40% of the total project costs through your ongoing generosity. So now let's do our next part and believe for the miracle means to pay off the balance owing. We're encouraging our entire church family to prayerfully consider participating in this intentional moment of giving. And we give knowing none of us can accomplish individually what all of us can do together. As always, giving online is safe and convenient through Calvary Connect or directly at calvary.ca slash give. If you prefer to give in person, you are welcome to do so here on Sunday mornings or during the week at the church office. Thank you for your contributions to the vision of Calvary. Hey, this is Vince. I'm so glad you're able to join us in church this morning. Uh, if there's something going on in life that you would like to have someone pray with you for, make sure you hit that live prayer button. Someone on my team or myself will make sure we engage with you and, and pray for whatever's going on in your life. Now, let's head into today's message with Pastor Steve. Show him some love in the chat. Welcome to episode four and the conclusion of our month-long Spirit of Truth series. Everything that the Lord is doing today in the earth, He's doing by His Spirit. And the series has focused on the important elements of who the Holy Spirit is. The person, the purpose, and the power of the Holy Spirit at work within our lives today. Now, in episode one, we explored the person of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the fact that he's not an it, right? He's the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then in episode two and three, we dug into the, the purpose of the Holy Spirit at work within our lives. And the infilling and the baptism of the Holy Ghost is not just to give us spiritual goosebumps, but to empower us to make a difference in the world that we're living in. And then in episode four today, we're going to look more at the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, unashamedly, we believe in the power, the gifts, and the fruit of the Holy Spirit at work within our lives and within our church. And last couple of weeks, or two weeks ago, we had a baptism service. And I tell you what, I love those services. And there's not a, a more powerful testimony to the power of the Holy Spirit transforming people's lives than there is when we can celebrate baptism, when people are, are setting forth with a new chapter and rising in Christ to a brand new 
day. I mean, that is just the, the, the visible reminder of the Spirit's work within us and within our church. Now, this past week, I was invited to Brampton, Ontario, uh, to join a group of ministers and churches from across Canada to come together to prayerfully discuss and talk about uh, the kingdom being established in our nation and to explore the ministry possibilities as we stand together in a very significant hour in our nation's future. I was also invited to speak at a friend's church in the city on Sunday, uh, someone that I love and have known for close to 30 years, and so it was great to be with them and in their new facility. And it was also great to spend time and to catch up with other leaders across the nation and some uh, pastors who have had an incredible influence and impact in Susan and I's life and, and ministry. But many of those who spoke, they talked about God moving by his spirit across our nation and around the world. Talked about taking the gospel to, to the, the places of the world that still need to hear it. Seeing lives transformed, seeing countries brought back to life. And seeing unreached people groups hear the gospel and encounter the Holy Spirit for the very first time. Now, our foundational scripture for this series is found in the book of Acts, in chapter 19, when Paul runs into a group of believers, Christ followers in Ephesus, and he asks them about the Holy Spirit. And their response, I think, is similar to some people today. Acts 19, verse 2 says, Paul asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, they answered, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Now, that may be true for you today. Maybe this is still a little new to you and you're not completely sure of it. Or perhaps maybe you grew up with a very clear understanding of who the Holy Spirit was in your life. And, and you're stronger because of it. Your family's stronger. Everything about your life has is, is been enriched because of your understanding of, of his power at work within your life. But I want you to know that both of those perspectives are okay. There's room for both of those perspectives here. You're in the right place to kind of figure it all out and to grow stronger with other people of like faith. Now, some people have kept the Holy Spirit at arm's length because he's been misrepresented by people uh, in their lives, perhaps. Uh, people they've come in contact with that are just like strange and we need to know that the Holy Spirit is not weird, he's not strange, but, but people can be. And so sometimes that puts people off because they, they kind of align the two. But maybe these unbalanced impressions that you've had have left you a little, a little confused, causing maybe further misunderstanding about who he is. And that's why I think it's very, very important that we have biblical clarity about someone who is so important in our lives especially if we're going to accomplish our God-given purpose. Now, as a church, we believe that the Holy Spirit is a gift from God to man. He was sent by God to be a helper to us. And he enters our lives at the moment of salvation and provides supernatural power beyond our human abilities. Power for living, uh, for understanding spiritual truth and and guiding us and teaching us in our daily lives. And that power enables every believer to, to do and to be whatever the Lord has purposed for each of us to do. Now, if you have your Bibles today, well, go ahead and in whatever form, doesn't matter to me, let's, let's jump back kind of to, to the beginning of the book of Acts, which gives an account of the Holy Spirit at work within the early church. Acts chapter one, verse eight says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. But why? For what purpose? Well, it says that to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the power of the Holy Spirit is the, the power of God. And he's been at work in the world since the beginning, since everything came into to being. And it was by his power that, that, that creation came about. The Holy Spirit possesses this dynamite-like power that works in every believer to blast out everything in our lives that's unlike God. 
And it's certainly not the power to exalt one person above the other. It doesn't manipulate. It doesn't control. Instead, the Holy Spirit uses his power to kind of break us, to remake us, to mold us in his image. And the more we get self kind of out of the way and yield ourselves to his will, the more powerfully he'll be able to pour himself in you and through you to the world that surrounds us. And we are the conduits. We're those channels that God uses to move his power through. Now, the Holy Spirit it enables and empowers us to be witnesses of God's love, to live in a way that pleases God, to meet fully the demands and the pressures of life, which we know are very real, and to resist temptation on a daily basis. The power of the Holy Spirit is the only power that is sufficient to win the spiritual battles against our own selfish desires and the divisive attacks that the enemy brings. We can't muster up enough strength within ourselves to resist those things on our own. We need his spirit at work within us. And his power was, was clearly demonstrated among the believers within the early church through the provision of spiritual gifts like speaking in tongues, prophesying, teaching, wisdom, faith, and, and more. And the good news is that those gifts didn't come to an end with the early church. Some people thought, well, that was then, this is now, it's just not the same time. You see, the, the Holy Spirit works in and through believers like you and me to accomplish his will. He's still doing that today. It didn't end then. And his power leads us. It convicts us, teaches us, and equips us to, to do his work as we continue to spread the gospel. The Holy Spirit's indwelling power is a, an amazing gift from God that we should never take lightly. But the way those gifts are manifest in our lives and within our churches may look different from place to place. And I think it's important to, to understand that, that God's always doing a new thing. Every day is a new day filled with possibility. And people, I think, just the way humans are, they try to recreate things that, that God did back in the day, the way the Holy Spirit used to move. And, and oftentimes they become resistant to the things that God is doing through his spirit today. People have said to me time and time again, why doesn't, Pastor Steve, why doesn't God do what he did here and there, like, like back in the day? Why doesn't he do it now? Well, I think to get a comprehensive answer, you'd have to ask him yourself. But as I look at it, uh, God doesn't just have one hit song that he plays over and over and over again. He's always doing something new in every generation. For instance, on the other side of the pandemic, after we all experienced all the, 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 that, what that isolation did to all of us, some of us are still dealing with that today. I see the Holy Spirit moving in, in a fresh way as groups are meeting beyond the Sunday gatherings, as people are caring for one another, growing together. Now, this is not a radically new thing, but it's a renewal of something that we've seen happening back in the early church where people understand the value of our community of faith, how we need one another in this walk that we're in. And as the Holy Spirit begins to move through these relationships, we grow in God. We begin to reflect more of him and less of us. He increases and we decrease. Now we also know that churches have culture, this expectation or maybe requirement to be a part of a, a certain group. And, and and all church cultures are different. If you've ever visited somebody else's church, you know that, that it feels different. The, the vibe of the, the house may be different than the one that you're accustomed to. Some churches that you go into may, may uh, be very boisterous. People may be speaking in tongues out loud. It may be something that's more common to them. And for other churches, it may be more of a, a quiet thing, a more personal thing. But what about us? What about us here at Calvary? What's our church culture. Well, first of all, you need to understand that there's no hierarchy in Christianity. God loves all of us the same. If you don't speak in tongues, then you're not a second-class Christian. 
It's only one of the gifts. And we do believe in speaking in tongues. We're a Pentecostal church, but we still come from all different backgrounds. So we have a love and an understanding that people are coming from different places. We are Calvary. We're made up of many different people. As a matter of fact, I speak in tongues in every worship service that we have on Sunday. As I'm ministering to people, as we're worshiping God together, But I wouldn't say it's a regular occurrence to hear it blurted out during a message or hear a platform host speaking in tongues. Now, I think most people, they don't take issue with the the gift of wisdom or faith or teaching. But when it comes to speaking in tongues, there's still some people that aren't completely sure. But for clarity, what is it? What is speaking in tongues? Well, it's one of the gifts of the Spirit mentioned in, in Scripture. As a matter of fact, the Bible mentions four different types, and I want to talk about a little, a little of that today. The first one is tongues as a sign to the unbeliever. We see this introduced in Acts chapter 2. Everyone listening to the disciples speaking in, in tongues were hearing some of them their own language being spoken. And this one kind of always seemed a little strange to me because it seemed like the unbelieving world would maybe struggle with this one more than most. I remember back when when Mike Pence was the vice president of the United States and he was very vocal about his faith. And some of the daytime talking heads were were kind of criticizing him for his, his faith, saying if that guy speaks in tongues, he's absolutely insane. And for some people, that's what they believe because they don't understand. 1 Corinthians 14, 22 says, Therefore tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But this scripture is talking about those who began speaking in a language that they were never taught or spoke before. But now they did. And others understood what they were saying very clearly. I remember a missionary telling me a story of his father when he first went to the mission field in Mexico. And in the middle of a service, he began to speak in, in, in tongues. And someone came up to him a little later in the service and commented on how beautifully he spoke the Spanish language. And he kind of had this puzzled look on his face and he said, I don't speak Spanish. I've, I've never spoken Spanish before. And yet... He did in that moment, a sign to the unbeliever. Now, I've said this before. I'll say it again. I am totally up for preaching to our Chinese campus uh, in fluent Mandarin if the Lord wants to drop that on me. So I- I'm ready to go. That would be wonderful. I wouldn't need a translator anymore. The second tongues that we see represented in Scripture is tongues for interpretation. Now, This one seemed to be a little bit more common in some church cultures back in the 80s, uh, but it's certainly not heard of today. It still happens. Uh, Someone would speak out in the service in tongues in a prayer meeting or a service, and then someone else would pipe up with an interpretation that, that the Lord would give them. Now, honestly, it seemed a little hit or miss to me over the years because people, I think, tried often a little too hard to make it happen, And I think we all need to be very careful when we say, thus saith the Lord. Uh, That's something that we need the fear of God in our lives, not to just blurt out if we don't know that he's prompting us to speak. 1 Corinthians 14.5 says, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. You know, I struggle today with people that are saying, I just need a word. I need a new a word. I need a word, Pastor Steve. You know, I need a fresh new word. And, and I think sometimes we need to step back and say, maybe before you ask God for a new word, you need to act on the word that he's already given you. And some of us have stalled out. Some of us have all the word we need, and yet we're still not walking in its truth. It's something for us all to consider. The third type of tongues that we see represented in Scripture is tongues for intercession. Now, sometimes we don't know what to pray in English. This has happened to me many times when I'm praying for my family or praying for our church family, where I just run out of words in English, and I don't know what else to pray. And so I pray in the Spirit. And when I do, it's like 
In my mind, it's like praying the perfect will of God for that moment as the Spirit prays through you. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You see, when we pray in the Spirit, we come into perfect alignment with God. And then finally, the, the last tongues that we see represented in Scripture is tongues in our personal prayer life. Now, I would say that, that this one is the most predominant type of speaking tongues in operation today. It's certainly true for our Calvary Church culture. 1 Corinthians 14.4 says, He who speaks in tongues edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. In Jude 1.20, it says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we need to build ourselves up. We need to edify ourselves. And so when we pray in our heavenly prayer language to God, we are edifying, we're encouraging, and we're, we're building ourselves up. I don't know about you, but there are many days when there's nobody around to do that for you. You have got to do it yourself. And when you begin to pray in the Spirit, it's like, it's like being your own coach as you get back up off the mat and say, I can do this. Because it's his work. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, it says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began, and I want to come back to that word began, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now that word began is a, is a verb. And there are two voices when it comes to verbs in the English language. This is a little mini grammar lesson for you. Now, in English, we have the active voice and we have the passive voice. The active voice means that the subject, and I'll use myself as kind of a, an example, it means that the subject is doing the action. So Stephen is speaking in tongues. That means I'm in control of what I'm saying. I can say whatever I want. Then there's the passive voice. This means the subject is undergoing the action rather than doing it. In other words, tongues are speaking through me. I don't have control. I've been taken over. So it seems like the only choices that we have in English is either it's being done to me or I'm doing it all by myself. We're either mim mimicking or manufacturing tongues uh, or we, we, we have no control over it. I don't know about you, but both of those options are disturbing to me, so oftentimes people push it off. But in the Greek, in the Greek, in the Greek, it's very important to understand that, that there's a different perspective here. The New Testament is written in Greek, and the third voice is the middle voice, which means there's a participation in the action that's taking place. It's a cooperative effort. So in the Greek language, that what it's really saying is began to means they didn't just flippantly do it on their own, nor were they kind of out of control, acting all cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, because that can happen sometimes. In other words, I stepped out in faith, and when I did, the power of the Holy Spirit came in and we became one. We were cooperating in this effort as I yielded my tongue to the power of the Holy Spirit. He came and brought the power in unity for us to do it together, right? Stephen, in cooperation with the partnership with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in tongues. We cooperated. It was a partnership. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 28 through 31 says, And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, Third, teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, and a variety of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? No, we know that. Matter of fact, tongues is at the end of that list. Do all interpret? Now listen to this. This is what I don't want you to miss. This is what I want you to take away with you today but earnestly desire the best gifts. 
or the greater gifts. Well, what are they? And yet I show you a more excellent way. What's the greater gifts? What's the more excellent way? Well, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and then it moves into chapter 13, which many of you know is referred to as the love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, and then down to 13 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. I've become an annoyance, right? You ever live in an area where somebody in the community next door is practicing drums and they're wailing away and you're like, man, when is that going to stop? We had a neighbor once that would get out and play the bagpipes. But that was a wonderful sound to me, right? But then it says this, and now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Can I encourage you today not to allow the different expressions of the gifts of the Spirit within the body of Christ to divide you or to, to cause strife? Void those unnecessary arguments. But let's eagerly desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit and always, always, always follow in the way of love. Would you pray with me today? Father, we thank you today for your Holy Spirit. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fill us with your empowering gifts. Fill our church, fill our lives, fill our families with your empowering gifts. That we would walk in your strength and your power so that we would accomplish all that we have been created and called to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. God's best to you all, Calvary. Have an amazing week. We look forward to seeing you again here next week. As a final act of worship, we want to give you the opportunity to worship with your tithes and offerings. And this is a chance for all of us to honor God with what he has given us and to invest in his kingdom. And I want to thank our entire Calvary family. It's because of your generosity that our ministry remains strong locally and abroad. So if you'd like to partner with us, you can do so by following the information at the bottom of the screen. And giving is safe and easy. Before you go, I'd like to pray for you and your giving. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for every giver, for every gift. And we pray that you would take what comes in and use it to further your kingdom. And that we would be blessed by all that you do through the ministry of Calvary Church. We love you so much. In your name, amen. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time for Calvary Church Online.